Greetings. I am addressing this to Tibet supporters and to people who could be Tibet supporters and stronger Tibet supporters. And I am putting on this YouTube in the context of March 10th because due to a, my own uh, problem, I wasn't able to address the crowd at the UN as I always like to do on March 10th. Although some wonderful speakers did address them, especially people from Students for Free Tibet and other wonderful people. But nevertheless, I felt bad that I didn't, since I have a record of over 30 years, or no, by more, 40 years of doing so. So I thought I would make a YouTube to, to speak up for Tibet and to hopefully get other people to speak up for Tibet. First point, Tibet is not a lost cause. Tibetan people will definitely be free again. I say this, although emotionally, like I think all of us, I tend to always fear and expect the worst. And I fear that the good guys won't win. I fear that the, you know, the climate will not improve. I fear that the bad guys will not desist from doing bad things. I have that kind of emotional makeup. A kind of I call it sometimes, in a new book I'm writing with my beloved Sharon Salzberg, I call it the super secret enemy of self-deprecation, thinking that somehow it will just never work out. So therefore, you know, I don't expect a lot, and I try to make the best of whatever there is, you know what I mean? I think we're very conditioned by our culture in the West, and maybe worldwide, to have such a view. The human being is generally conditioned by the general authoritarian cultures to feel they have to make do with less than what they want. Their imagination is curbed that way and then they accept less than ideal leadership from leaders and leading cliques and leading individuals who definitely will give you less than you want because they are incompetent and because they are unable to do so. So uh, I, emotionally, I feel like that, and I feel maybe many of you, even if you go and you say, free Tibet now, maybe you kind of tend to feel maybe it really isn't going to happen, but you feel you must say that, because, of course, it should happen. So, that's my emotional feeling, is that kind of lost cause feeling. However, intellectually speaking, my judgment of the nature of the world now is that colonial domination and basically imperialism and what China is doing in Tibet, the Chinese government, Communist Party is doing in Tibet is basically 21st century imperialism, 20th and 21st century imperialism. This really cannot work anymore. Imperialism flourished when people were illiterate in the colonialized country, when they didn't know any better, they didn't know their own ability, they didn't know the need of the people dominating them, they didn't know the limits of the power of the people dominating them. They couldn't communicate with the country, people, the people of that country, and therefore they could be oppressed by a government without the people in that country really knowing what was being done to the people in the colonial area. So in general, what Al Gore, in his beautiful book called The Future, calls the global mind. In the, in colonialism was possible and could be profitable for an elite clique before there was such a thing as the global mind. Now we have the global mind. This is like the internet, Facebook, Google. So the global mind makes colonial domination impossible in the long run. And it never was actually good for anybody. The people in Europe who ate all the sugar that they grew in the tropical countries where they were enslaving people, it made them sick. The sugar it shortened their lifespan and not to mention their conscience. And they got all kind of different diseases out of it, you know. The overseers who whipped the slaves died too young and were ruined their own sensitivity by being brutal, brutalized themselves by brutalizing other people and so on. So it never has been a good thing. Jesus said not to do it, Buddha said not to do it. 
Confucius said not to do it. All the great teachers of humanity said not to do it, do that kind of thing, one human to another. And they did it not just because it's some sort of do-gooder ideal that no one could ever live up to, but they did it because it is the best way to be. Loving your enemy means wanting your enemy to be happy. If your enemy is happy, then they won't bother to be your enemy what they, because they won't feel you're blocking their happiness. Someone is someone else's enemy because they feel that the person they are the enemy of is preventing them from being happy. So they have to get rid of that person, deal with them in some way, get rid of them, and then they can be happy. If they're already happy, they don't have any enemies because they're satisfied themselves. So if you want your enemy to be happy, that's a way of getting rid of your enemy, really, which means they're happy and they don't need you to get out of their way to be happy. Okay, so that's really very simple idea. It's a little, it might seem complicated, but it's really very simple. So what I'm saying is that China, it is, does not benefit China to oppress Tibet. It benefits China. One of the reasons that people think that China will never let go of Tibet uh, to, to any degree, I mean, not necessarily insisting they completely let go, certainly they're responsible for having destroyed a lot of Tibet, and they have to rebuild and repair and make amends. Just like the U.S. has to make amends in Iraq, has to make, had to make amends in Vietnam, still hasn't really made amends in different places where it made a mess, by, it was too destructive. So China will have to do that in Tibet. So it's, they want, we want them to be responsible for the damage they caused in Tibet. Absolutely. We don't want them just to walk away and leave a mess. So uh, China, but China will immensely benefit by changing its attitude to the ethnic so-called ethnic minorities, which are actually the other nations, which are the Tibetans, the Uyghurs, the Mongolians, and the Manchurians, who are in the areas that are peripheral to classical China, and who, but who are very smaller populations, but they live in these areas that they know how to live in and take care of the environment of, which the Chinese people do not. They are ruining the environment of everywhere they excessively spread to. And so, they will benefit enormously by giving these people ethnic self-determination within a Chinese federation, like the Russians. You know, the Russian had Soviet Union where they were suppressing everybody and trying to force them all to be Russian communists. The Ukrainians were trying to, they were trying to force them to be Russians, whereas they're actually Ukrainians. And that failed, and they lost those people. And, uh, but then they did keep a lot of the people in their ethnic thing under the guise of the Russian Federation. And if the Russian Federation offers benefits to those who have it, like the European Common Market does, the EU, then the Russian Federation could, re, could have new membership of the, the Ukrainian can rejoin as a, as a really self-determined republic. They could rejoin, and they might benefit from rejoining, and to trade union, etc., economically. The old political military way of forcing people into a colonial union is, it just doesn't work. The Europeans, the British deconstructed their empire, Portuguese left Africa, French left Africa and so forth, be, militarily and politically because it doesn't work. It wasn't just that they were all suddenly saintly, they realized it, it's too expensive and it doesn't work. It's better to have an economic market interconnection and which means that the other side gets some benefit out of it. Economic exchange is better than military domination because in economic exchange, the other side gets a benefit, you get a benefit. That's a merchant class is better than the military class. And they, they, they both sides produce wealth and then they exchange it and it's much better. In the case of Tibet, if the Tibetans control their own economy, then the Chinese could still invest, they could still make deals with the Tibetans, they would get good deals from the Tibetans, but the Tibetans would get something. Currently, the Chinese claim they spend so much money in Tibet, why aren't the Tibetans grateful? But the problem is they spend it like a colonial power on the comfort and the improve, economic improvement of their own colonists, not on the Tibetans. The Tibetans are unemployed, disenfranchised, put in a prison camp, basically, and the Chinese Settlers there are the ones who flourish and have businesses and, and uh, have jobs and so on. So that has to change simply because, and it will be in China's interest to change it, and it will help China on many, many levels. So that's what I want to, so that then makes me intellectually feel that because China will not lose by Tibet being free, but will benefit by Tibet being free, 
That's why I intellectually say it will happen in spite of my programming to always expect the worst. And how will they benefit? They will benefit because the Tibetans will be happy. They will benefit because when they're happy, they will take good care of Tibet. The headwaters of all of China's river systems rise in Tibet, and they're currently depleting those river systems by destroying the Tibetan environment, which they don't know how to manage. Tibetans do know how to manage it, and they will restore the headwaters of the Chinese rivers. That's the first benefit. Second, the Tibetans will create a much bigger tourist bonanza in Tibet, because tourists will want to go and see free Tibetans happily in Tibet. Only the Chinese go there like Americans might go see some Indian reservation now, and it's a, it's a limited economy for the Chinese. It's, it doesn't make the kind of foreign exchange money they could make by the Tibetans making that money for them. And then the Tibetans would be taking care of themselves economically, and the Chinese wouldn't have to subsidize them. They'd just make an investment, and then they would get profit. So that, that's the second benefit. Third benefit is China would not be doing something against the Chinese individual person and collective people's conscience, which they do by destroying and imprisoning and torturing and killing and beating up the Tibetans. They, the people who beat other people up don't enjoy it. They get sick from doing it. Uh, people wrongly assume that they like doing that, they're sadistic or something, but a sadistic person is a frustrated person. They are harmful to another because they can't get pleasure themselves. And so then they think being harmful, but actually they don't get real pleasure out of it. It's just a lot like a release of moving their frustration from one place to another. It's not true pleasure. So they would get a conscience and a moral benefit from doing it. That is a significant benefit. It relates to your health. It relates to your enjoyment of your own life. That would be another huge benefit. Then, once that was the case, they wouldn't have to hide the truth from their own people of what they were doing in Tibet. So their own, they, could, they could relax on all the censoring and all the brainwashing and the thought control, and they could let people know things about it. Then, the Uyghurs would see that the Chinese are capable of making a fair deal with somebody, and making a new deal for somebody, and then they would think, well, maybe there's a reason why we could join the Chinese Union, and they could like have a degree of freedom, and they could have a positive relationship with them. Mongolians are the same, Manchurians are the same. Then all their neighbors, the Indians, the Nepalese, the Bhutanese, everyone would be happy all around China, the South Koreans, the Japanese, they would see that the Chinese are capable of not crushing what they control of letting it flourish, and letting its flourishing enhance their flourishing, like they're doing in Hong Kong. At least they, 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 they have a little bit broken their agreement in Hong Kong, but they do allow one country, two systems, and Hong Kong continues to flourish and bring wealth to China. So that's really very, very good. Then if their own people were happier in China, they wouldn't have to spend so much money on police control, thought control, surveillance, they complain that they spend more money controlling their own people than they do with foreign defense. And that's really silly to have such a police, expensive police state. So now take Buddhism. Now the Dalai Lama is the foremost world leader of Buddhism, beloved everywhere, even those who are not Buddhists love him. And he could be a great spokesperson for China's peacefulness. He could get people not to be irritated by China's economic success. He could make China respected. He could speak for China, and th that would be a tremendous thing externally that he could do. He still has 10, 20 good years left where he's a very senior statesman, but very, very still high energy, very respected. He could be a great goodwill ambassador for China. And then internally in China, he could teach Dharma to the Chinese, and the Chinese Buddhist masters would love it. The Chinese Buddhists would love him, just like the Taiwanese Buddhists do now, Chinese Buddhist communities in America or anywhere there in Europe or in Sing Hong Kong, Sing in Singapore, etc., anywhere where he's been allowed to go, they love the Dalai Lama, and he's extremely successful. The Chinese people from mainland China even go to India to, to listen to the Dalai Lama. He's so popular. So this would, and by patronizing him like the emperors of old did, the rulers of China would be able to get credit from their people for patronizing a national master who would make their people happy. So that's an enormous benefit that Tibet would bring. So it would bring economic benefit, it would bring moral benefit, it would bring spiritual benefit, and it would bring diplomatic benefit. And China says they want stability. When people are happy, and they like their government, and they like the, and the officials are not oppressing them, 
and beating them and torturing them, then people are happy. Then you have stability. That's what stability is. As Confucius and Mencius define stability, it is when the masses of the people have their own plot of land, they grow their own rice, they're free to have their children in a school there, they hire a school master, and they have a stake in the flourishing of the larger society because they own, they have a space within which they can flourish. They're not being exploited and oppressed. And that's true stability. The seeming stability that is brought up by oppression doesn't work. Look at the Manchu Empire. Look at the nationalists. The communists took over China because there was instability because of excessively oppressive government. So now China is capitalist government, a plutocracy like America is, and they are oppressing their people too much, and that is unstable. So no wonder they talk about stability. Finally, with the capitalist success of China, although the de environmental destruction, self-destruction that has been part of that capitalist success means it's not a sustainable capitalist success, so it's not real capitalist success, it's temporary capitalist success, but, but it still is success, and that success then enables China to be strong enough and self-confident enough to change the governmental system into a multi-party system, to allow people freedom of assembly, freedom of information, freedom of uh, speech, and this will allow the leadership in China to know what people feel and think and to adapt policies to what people really need and feel and think. And this will produce stability. And to do it voluntarily and structurally from the top, is a, it will be a wonderful historical thing and it will, be, it will be like a truly historic. And the Chinese Politburo of today, who's capable of doing that, and of releasing dictatorial control, because they are admitting that they are no longer communist, but they are a capitalist government. And the country is a capitalist country. And really recognize that and make it an ethically capitalist country and a democratic capitalist country. This will be a tremendous benefit to China. It could not be a greater benefit. Zhao Ziyang would be rehabilitated, Hu Yaobang would be rehabilitated. They would realize that mistakes were made in the process of trying to catch up with the world. But that's all right. Those leaders who did great things, they'll be remembered for the great things. Those who made some errors, those errors will be remembered also. And then people in the future can see that rather than whitewashing everything. And they can go forward in a positive way. So the final slogan I would say is freedom for Tibet is freedom for China. A master-slave relationship, the master is a slave to his slave as well as the master to his slave. Because the, the warden of the prisoner is imprisoned by having to keep the prisoner in a prison. Both are chained to the two different sides of the bar. Maybe the warden is more comfortable, but still he's still a prisoner to that structure and that system. So China will not know and have freedom the Chinese president and his controlling party will not receive a Nobel Peace Prize and be respected by, therefore, by the world until they are voluntarily able to decentralize power, to devolve power purposely, like the Dalai Lama recently did. He resigned his power over the Tibetan government in exile. He proclaimed he will not hold power as a religious leader he will not hold political power in a future Tibet. He showed them the example of how wonderful he was so happy when he was not burdened by the pressure of having to carry responsibility for everyone. And they were the, the power was devolved on them to be responsible for themselves. And he was free, actually, of that, of that pattern. So this is what the Chinese government will do. And if you do it voluntarily, that will be good. If you don't do it voluntarily, you will go the way of the Manchu Emperor, you will go the way of the nationalist dictator and the warlord, and people will eventually overthrow you. Your own people, not the Tibetans, not the Americans, not the Russians, no, nobody else. Your own people will, will do that. And then it will be very unpleasant, and the people who do it probably will be unpleasant because they'll have to behave unpleasantly to get rid of you. And it will be a bad, endless cycle of a bad thing. Be like the Han Wuli Emperor, who replaced the Qin dynasty of an autocracy, which was useful perhaps to pull the warlords together to unify the country. But once unified, it became overly oppressive, 
and the 10,000 year dynasty only lasted 25 years, and, and they stupidly burned the books of Confucius and the enlightened, liberal, moral, ethical, wonderful Chinese philosophy. And then the Han Wuli Emperor, he brought it back. And he created a really proper Chinese polity. Of course, that was in the days when everybody had an emperor, but he was more sensitive to the people's needs. He allowed spirituality to flourish. He followed the teachings of Confucius and Mencius, and therefore he had a 400-year prosperous run and even added Buddhism to it toward the latter part of that run, and Buddhism brought more blessing to the Chinese people, spiritually speaking, totally reinforcing Confucianism, totally being friendly with Taoism, without, and creating the, what's called the harmony of the three teachings that China has been known for. Unlike Western, less tolerant religious groups, Chinese religious groups were famously tolerant in the past period. So this is what I have to say, that's my slogan for March 10th, Free Tibet, free China. That's really what it is. The Tibet movement is not anti-China. The Tibet movement is against an obsolete form of Chinese governance and international colonial policy that is self-destructive to China and to the Chinese people. And Tibet wants to free the people and free the government from this, this self-destructive, obsolete pattern of behavior. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, if the Chinese government can do that with its great power and the great respect that it will get from that, then the Russians and the U.S. and any other autocracy left on the planet will definitely change. The U.S. will become less of a plutocracy and revive its somewhat stultified democracy. Russia will revert to the democracy that it tried to, is beginning to try to do, and the world will be at peace. And then China will be total leader of the world in a peace offensive. It will really be peaceful rise. It will really be what the slogans that have been promoted but have not been lived up to heretofore. So happy Tibetan Uprising Day. We have the, this year being the 100th year of Tibetan Independence Day, which was the 13th Dalai Lama's February 13th proclamation. That's what we really want to call Independence Day, July 4th, the equivalent of American July 4th, or French July 14th. The March 10th is the Uprising Day, Tibetan Resistance Day. And, uh, and I think the day, the day when China, when the Chinese president, whenever it is, meets with the Dalai Lama in Beijing to sign the autonomous, the true, the reunification of the Tibet Plateau under the Tibetan Autonomous Regional Government, that day will be true Tibetan Freedom Day. And it will be independence within a Chinese Federation if the Chinese do it voluntarily and do it by on purpose and set the example for the world. It will be truly wonderful. In exchange for that, Tibetans will be a highly valuable contributing member to the Chinese Federation, uh, the United States of China, let's call it, the USC of Asia, you know, it'd be really great, you know. Okay, thank you.